Do you know what they call alternative medicine that's been proven to work? Medicine. Welcome to the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast, a show about energy healing, holistic, and plant medicine. Our passion is healing on all levels. You'll hear guests from doctors, yoga teachers, energy healers, researchers, coaches, and real people who've recovered from serious debilitating health conditions, getting to the root of the problem and solving it. And this is not medical advice. Welcome to the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast. And now your host, William Dickinson. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Holistic Healing Collective podcast. Today, we are joined by Elizabeth Collins. She's a guest that has divinely joined me today. Divine coincidence has decided to join me today. I've got a buyer for her here. So Elizabeth is the owner of the East West Company, an integrative wellness practice specializing in burnout, recovery coaching, functional medicine, acupuncture, and more. I love the sound of all of that. So this is going to go in a great direction. She uses her combined backgrounds in both Eastern and biomedicines, as well as her training in hypnosis to approach healing from a perspective that seeks to fully integrate the mind, body, and spirit. That is exactly what it is that we look to do here on this podcast. So as I like to get started with everybody, how did you get into this, Elizabeth? What moved you (laughs) towards this career? You know, a lot of serendipity over the years is kind of what got me here. Um, So I got a bachelor's degree in chemistry a million years ago when dinosaurs were the earth. <laughs> and um, at the time, I really didn't want to go into a medical field. That seemed really daunting to me. And so I spent kind of a decent chunk of my mid-20s just sort of wandering and working a bunch of different jobs. And, you know, I was a waitress. I did administrative work for a financial advisor. And I started working at a hospital in an administrative capacity. And I saw I, it was, um, I was in an outpatient unit for physical therapy, occupational therapy, sports therapy. And I was like, this could be interesting. Like the people who do that work seem to really like it. So I pivoted to become a patient care technician in uh, the oncology unit at that hospital um, in the cancer unit. Wow, and okay. yeah, it was really interesting. And uh, as a technician, again, you're very limited in what you're doing. You're basically taking vital signs and triaging people into their appointments and getting quick summaries. And that's about it. And I really enjoyed that. So I was like, all right, let's take the next step. And I became an emergency medical technician. So I worked on an ambulance and I did that for three years. And in the process of doing that similar thing, I was like, your scope is pretty limited. You deal with people in kind of like the worst moments of their lives. And then you drop them off at the hospital and you never know what happens Mm -hmm. unless you have a good rapport with the triage nurse, which I did. Um, But there's no guarantee that you're ever going to find out what happened to those people. So I was looking at either becoming a physician assistant or a doctor. I wasn't sure kind of which track I wanted to take at that point. And I had been in biomedicine long enough to see that while there are some amazing things that biomedicine does really, really well, specifically emergency medicine is fantastic. Antibiotics are a miracle. Um, You know, a lot of, there's a lot of great things that biomedicine offers it appeared that people got very limited time with their patients, you know, primary care physicians, you get anywhere from like five to 15 minutes if you're lucky. And a lot of it was medicating people and taking care of symptoms. And I really wanted to approach it from a more comprehensive perspective. Um, And I wanted to do healthcare instead of sick care. Yes. So I had actually broken my arm Um, And I was on leave while that healed because I couldn't be an emergency medical technician with a broken arm. And a friend of mine said, I know this tarot reader. She's amazing. You should go see her. And I said, all right, I've literally got nothing but time. So I went to see this woman. Her name's Corby Mitlide. She's really great. And she said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do a career spread. And she said, what are you looking at? And I said, something healthcare oriented. And I kind of don't care what it is. I could be massage therapy, you know, yoga instruction, chiropractic, something. And she said, okay. So she flipped seven cards and she did one for each modality, massage therapy, acupuncture, craniosacral therapy, aromatherapy, you know, she kind of ran the gamut. And she flipped them all over and she said, acupuncture is where the money's at. That's where you're going to be really successful. It's going to be where you're really happy. And it's going to open a lot of doors for you. So I went home and I Googled the word acupuncture and vaguely aware of what it was. And 
there was an acupuncture school an hour from my house. And I kind of live sort of in the middle of nowhere in Western Mm -hmm. New York. When you hear about New York, you think New York City, and that's like a really small dot in a big rural state. Um, So I kind of lived in the country and it was the last place you would expect an acupuncture school to be. So I looked into it and I really loved the idea of that. So I applied, got in, became an acupuncturist. And that's kind of how I got into the holistic realm. And then everything else after that just sort of snowballed because I am addicted to continuing education and I had a really terrible case of imposter syndrome. So I felt like I needed to have all of the skills and know all of the things. Um, So that's kind of what led me to hypnosis and functional medicine. They're very fascinating things to me. And from coming from a, a science background and a chemistry background, the functional medicine was great because that's sort of like if Eastern medicine and biomedicine had a baby. So you're, you know, running labs on people and maybe giving them supplements, but you're also tweaking their lifestyle and creating more sustainable changes for them that will improve their health over the long term. So that's kind of the the five minute elevator speech of how I got into doing what I'm doing. That is absolutely phenomenal. That is such an interesting story because it's so, as you said, it's so serendipitous. There's so much there's so much coincidence. There's so much, there's so much ease to it. And I think that first of all, you have to be open to that kind of thing. Some people you say, let's go for a tarot reading. That's just crazy stuff. There's no logic behind that. So they they won't go for it. But the fact that you're open to it means you're kind of, you're being nudged sort of the whole way. You're just like, oh, this is the easy way. Go for it. And you listen and you receive and and it allows it to happen, which is really cool. And did you find this to be true? Was acupuncture really the do you think it was the best gateway through? Was it, was that where the money was? <laughs> Not for the first few years, because starting a business is really challenging, yeah. but yes, it became a, a very sustainable thing that I could do, you know, energetically, I feel good doing it. And you know, with the burnout piece of that, that came from running the business, not from Mm -hmm. doing acupuncture. When I'm in a room treating a patient, I'm in heaven. Yeah, It's it's the easiest thing in the world. It's something that comes very naturally to me and I really enjoy doing it. So it really was, I feel like the best starting point for me. So that's a a nice segue onto to burnout. So as you said, you, you love doing this, you love the experience of actually doing the work, but that's not for, for talented healers, that's not the hard part. The hard part is bringing that entrepreneurial edge where you actually have to get clients in the door. So is that what fueled the burnout for you? It was the, the business side of things. Yeah, absolutely. That was one of many things. And I think it's, you know, burnout is this thing that's sort of come on the scene in the last five or so years. And originally it was sort of pegged for people in biomedical professions, doctors, nurses, Mm. you know, hospital workers, EMTs, people who are working shift work and doing very intense work. That's sort of where they initially identified burnout. And as we've expanded the way that we think about it, you can burn out doing anything. You can burn out doing that. You can burn out being a lawyer or a CEO. You can burn out being an entrepreneur. You can be a burnout being a stay-at-home parent, which I think happened to a lot of parents during the pandemic when they were all of a sudden teachers and you know, it's trying to do their jobs at home. So burnout can come kind of from anywhere. And because we don't have a lot of language around it right now, you know, we're getting there. People don't know that they're in it. I certainly didn't. Somebody else identified it for me. Uh, the woman who became my burnout recovery coach, mm-hmm. um, she had run an acupuncture, a couple of very successful acupuncture practices. And at one point I was struggling with mine, an organization that sent me a lot of referrals um, and outsourced to um contractors in the community kind of just shut that down. So it wasn't something that was personal to me. Like, we don't like you. We're not going to send you patients anymore. They just said, no, we're just kind of going to do reshuffle some things and do some stuff in house for a while. And much of my practice was reliant on that for income. That was about half of my, my patient base at that time. So I was gutted. And so I reached out to Kate and I said, you ran two super successful practices. Like what's, what's the magic? What's the secret sauce with this? And she goes, Oh, I burnt out doing that. I burned out really bad doing that twice and you're burnt out. And so we're going to work on that. And that's how you're going to fix everything. And that's how you're going to come back to your practice. And I was like, I, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea because I was running my practice the way that I thought I was supposed to, not in the way in which was, you know, in alignment with who I am as an individual, my values, the things that I want and need for my life as a whole. And I think that's very common in the entrepreneurial sphere. 
It's like, oh, you, you have to go to networking events. You have to do this. You have to advertise. You have to be on Instagram. And it's like, you, you don't. Do you like those things? Do they feel good to you? Is putting energy into them, getting energy out, you know? So very, very interesting. And I would, I would agree. I would agree with you. The, the feeling is, is very important. The energy behind what's happening is more often than not more important than what you actually do. And that's clearly in your case to do with business, but that's also health, it's relationships, it's the energy, always follow the energy. Energy is, is paramount of, of, of in paramount importance. So absolutely. So for somebody watching, you, you said that you, you struggled with burnout and you were disidentified from the fact that that was burnout. So I'd imagine that other people watching might be like, that's not me. I don't have burnout. So if you're in this place where you're disidentified from the fact that you actually have burnout, how do you, how do you bridge that gap? How do you bring that into your awareness that burnout is actually something that you're struggling with? That's a really good question because it is a very personal experience for people, but I find that it shows up in several ways, both physical and mental, emotional, psychological, spiritual. I love so, that. So yeah, and it's, it's interesting because like, oftentimes we don't think about the physical aspects of burnout, which is something that I specialize in being in functional medicine. And so some of the physical symptoms that people see with burnout is fatigue, brain fog, um, digestive issues where like you're getting bloating or like all of a sudden you're feeling like, oh, I can't tolerate the stuff that I used to be able to eat with ease. Um, kind of random aches and pains, you know, nothing that really kind of lays you out, nothing that you would necessarily see a doctor for, but it's also, you're not living kind of an optimal life, you know? And a lot of people think that this is just the way life has to be. And it, it does not have to be that way. From the mental and emotional side of things, a uh, short temper can be a big one. If you're just kind of like mm. edgy all the time and resentment is a really big one that we, we talk about in the burnout realm, because that's a really good indicator that you don't have particularly good boundaries in place, or you're not adhering to or aware of your own values, wants, preferences, needs, and desires. So if you're finding like every time an email pings, you know, if you got your email up hundred percent of the time while you're working on your computer and it pings and it pings and it pings. And every time you hear it, you're just like, Oh my God, your molars are grinding. You're resentful about that. It's taking your attention away from something. So an easy way to fix that is turn your notifications off and check your email twice a day. Right. So resentment so, is a powerful yes. tool there. Yeah. I found resentment is one of, if not the most powerful indicators that I'm out of alignment and that it's really my fault that I'm out of alignment, and that there's something that I'm not doing. Exactly. It's the internal boundaries. Yeah, yes. Exactly. And that's one of the big things that we work with in burnout because, you know, we talk about external boundaries of, you know, being able to set limits with people or boundaries mm. with people. We don't think about that with ourselves. And so one of my internal boundaries when I first started was I had, I didn't separate myself from work as much as I could or should have, because I was so nervous about getting people through the door that I felt like I had to have my phone on all the time. And I needed to get back to people if they wanted to schedule, you know, on a Sunday, I would text people on a Sunday night. Like I'm mm. not supposed to be at work. My office isn't open, but I was worried if I didn't get back to them, they'd get mad. They'd go to somebody else. And it wasn't uh, internally. I wasn't connecting the dots of like, like, no, you deserve downtime. And no medical office is open on a Sunday night unless it's an urgent care or an emergency or something mm -hmm. like that. So I was really strung out, like responding to text messages and phone calls seven days a week from probably 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. And there was wow. no separation there. There was no time for me to just sit and breathe and feel disconnected from that world. And I got really resentful. I'm like, oh God, why are these people texting me at like 5 p.m. on a Sunday? It's not their fault. That's when they have the availability to text. It's my responsibility to hold that internal boundary with myself and say, my hours start at noon on Monday. I will get back to that message at noon on Monday or 1 p.m. whenever I have the availability to when I'm back in the office. So that was an internal boundary that I had to set. And that's one of the places that resentment really shows up for people mm -hmm. is if you're resenting something from someone else or something else, also look inward. Like mm -hmm. sometimes, yes, it can be somebody pushing your buttons, but do they know about those buttons? 
Yeah. So yeah. I, so trying to look into the root of this and understand it, I feel like more often than not, we, we have weak boundaries because we feel like we have to sacrifice our boundaries for survival in some way. So in your case, this is clearly financial survival because obviously you need to pay your bills, you need food, you need these things. So you, you were feeling like you had to sacrifice this peace of mind, this collectedness that you would be able to have this boundary of saying like, no, I'm not working now. But how were you able to overcome that, that barrier you had where you felt like you needed to break through your own boundaries in order to be able to receive that income? How did you, how did you facilitate that shift? Because that's, that's a difficult shift to make. How did you do that? It can be. And that, that actually happened. I established better boundaries with that before um, I got into burnout recovery. That was one of okay. the places that I noticed that like, okay, like this just is not healthy. And after I had been in practice a couple of years, I was like, no one answers messages on a Sunday. Like it's fine. And most of my practice was established at that point. So I knew a lot of my patients mm -hmm. and I was getting referrals and things like that. So it wasn't as critical to me. I didn't have that scarcity okay. mindset quite as much. Okay. And so what I ended up doing was I took one of my old iPhones. When you replace the iPhone, I brought that one to work and I have an app that is associated with my work number. Mm -hmm. And I just left it here. So right. it's on physical messages boundary. go through, but it's a physical boundary. I don't Brilliant. take that home with me. That's fantastic. So yeah, that made a big difference for me in that instance, but there were a ton of other places where that wasn't the case, where that came up when I did my burnout recovery. So do you think that it's almost a prerequisite of being able to establish these boundaries that you're empowered enough to a point where you're able to say, I'm actually, okay, I can survive with this boundary in place. So becoming empowered is a pr almost a prerequisite of being able to do that. Yes, and because in some cases, setting those boundaries is actually what creates the space for the correct things to come in. Because at that point, initially, I wasn't looking for the patients that resonated with what I do as an individual and as an acupuncturist, because people specialize in all sorts of things. You know, I specialize in orthopedics, other people specialize in fertility, and I like fertility and I do fertility with patients, but that's not kind of what I'm known for mm -hmm. in the Providence area. And, but I was so kind of desperate for patients that I was just trying to get anybody instead of trying to get the people who are the best ones for me. So when I started burnout recovery, um, one of the first things that my coach had me do, um, because my numbers were, were kind of low after the referrals had stopped from the mm. organization that I was working with, um, I was talking to friends a lot. I was trying to, you know, get support from my network, but not in a way that was efficient or helpful. I was just putting a lot of energy out. I was talking mm -hmm. to a lot of people, you know, and, and that's, I think, normal. They say, you know, you have to have a community. You have to have friends. You have to have this group of people you can rely on. But in the day and age of cell phones and text messaging and all of that, it, it can be almost constant. So I was talking to a lot of people throughout the week in the middle of the day that I didn't need to be talking to that frequently. Mm -hmm. So Kate said, for two weeks, do not talk to anyone un unless they call you and they say, I'm bleeding out or I'm on fire. Don't answer. If somebody asks how you're doing, don't answer. It's okay. You can get back to that message anytime. You know, anybody that you talk to, she's like, do you talk to your parents like every day? I was like, no, maybe once a week. It doesn't stress me out. She goes, okay, you can talk to them. A couple of the people let them know, but pretty much everybody else just kind of go off grid. You don't have to go mm -hmm. off social media, but like, just, just stop putting so much energy out into mm -hmm. the world because you're bleeding energy. And I did for two weeks at the end of two weeks, she was like, how was that? I was like, can we do two months? Can we do two years? Can this be my life? <laughs> she was like, yes, because it's your life. You can do whatever you want. In that two weeks, I booked 10 new patients. Wow. From completely random places. They found me on Google. A friend referred them. They, you know, saw something assigned somewhere or came across a business card. So it wasn't like, oh, my referral source started back up. Hmm. 10 new patients from not having booked new patients for a couple of months and losing a referral source. But my energy was home. 
Okay. So, so I had to make that energy. change in order for that to happen. So yes, sometimes being in a, in a place that gives you more of a sense of security gives you, affords you the ability to set a boundary. And sometimes setting that boundary needs to happen in order for that energy mm-hmm. to come into alignment. Wow. That's a, I think that's a, a that's like a mind blowing um, perspective. The, the change in the behavior shifts the energy, which then allows everything to change. So the the frantic behavior of being busy all of the time and trying to grab appointments all of the time is actually in a way a form of resistance. By doing this, you're actually pushing appointments away. So when you stop yep. and you center yourself and you pull your energy back in, you allow everything to begin to flow to you again. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because since that point, you know, businesses are businesses, they ebb and flow. And so I've had points where I'm extremely busy and then I've had points that are a little bit slower. Mm-hmm. But after that experience of kind of bringing my energy back inward and having that create space for 10 new patients in two weeks, that happened in two weeks, um, I stress less now when I go through one of those, Mm -hmm. those sort of slumps of things are slowing down a little bit, or, you know, I haven't gotten new patients. I don't freak out about it because I'm like, okay, where's my energy? That's my first question. That's what I go back to. Instead of immediately going to that scarcity mindset of like, oh my God, nobody's in the books. It's like, that's that's still in there a little bit, but it's not the predominant mm-hmm. feeling anymore. Mm-hmm. So if we apply this whole energetic template that you just discussed, does this also apply to a healing approach? Oh yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Because Again, like I said, I've said several times, burnout is very individual. Healing is very individual. And so you need to have a sense of what's right for you as an individual. What's right for me is not going to be the same thing that works for you. So what you're saying is, in, so if we applied this model, it would sort of be like frantically trying to work with all of the different practitioners and trying all of the different supplements and just grabbing at anything, looking for that miracle cure. It's pushing the energy out. It's pushing your health away. Because if you're able to sort of just settle yourself and be like, okay, this is where I'm at. What's really the thing that I need? That's actually going to allow the health and the healing to, to come, to come, the symptoms to resolve, the health to improve, the sensitivities to calm down. So it's, it's the same thing. You can apply this template to healing too. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's a very useful way to do it because when you are doing that kind of kitchen sink approach of, of just trying desperately to do mm-hmm. anything and everything that you can, even if you get improvement, you're not going to know what the improvement was from. Was it from supplements? Was it from meditation? Was it from diet? Was it from, and so, you know, sometimes we'll do things where we'll tweak your diet and give you some supplements at the same time um, in my practice, but that type of thing can also be very overwhelming for people. It becomes a lot to manage, to try and change your diet and start a new supplement regimen and start meditation. Like these are not simple things. They sound simple, but when you have to completely pivot the way that you eat from however you've been eating for two years, five years, 10 years, your whole life, that's not a small change and it's not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. So giving people a little bit of space for the grace to get through sort of the discomfort that comes along with that change, you know, get that in place and have that feel good to you. If it feels good to you, you may make that change and find out this is not something that's working for me. That's also good information to have. Let's look over here. Let's look over Mm -hmm. there. What's the next option? And we do that a lot with burnout recovery because people who are burnt out don't have the mental or emotional resources to take on a whole 30 dietary change Mm -hmm. or to start meditating every day. Like meditation is really, really hard for burnt out brains because your brain shrinks when you, when you're burnt out and the connection between the left and right hemispheres becomes less efficient. So having somebody sit down for even five minutes to try and meditate can actually in, like induce anxiety attacks. So usually what we'll do is we'll be like, breathe for one minute, like set a timer for one minute and just take four or five deep breaths. Like that's your meditation for the day. That's it. And as you start to do that a little more, do that a couple times a day. If you can manage to do it when you start to feel stressed out, that's great. That's one thing. And it seems like, again, a very small thing, but it is not an insurmountable thing to do. You're not asking somebody to climb a mountain. You're asking them to take one step uh, up a set of stairs. And that's the sort of stepwise approach versus, you know, 
having sat on your couch for five years and then deciding that you're going to go hike a mountain. That's, that's sort of that grabbing approach to yeah. anything and everything. So in essence, it's almost lose, lose sight of the end goal, just focus on the direction that you're going and the next step that you need to take towards that. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime you can chunk something down into making it a more manageable mm. option, that's where you're going to see the progress. So you made a, a point just a second ago that made me, it was a really nice interjection for something that I wanted to ask you. So I, I had a, a very significant healing breakthrough where I, I was on a very restricted diet of six foods for five, five plus years, very restricted. Wow. Yeah. And I had a huge breakthrough with a, a bucket of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. So I've actually got a video of it, of <laughs> me recording the breakthrough. It is phenomenal, that. heartbreaking. Like you watch it, you will cry. It mm. is, it's a deep like trauma release kind of thing. It was remarkable. Yeah. And since then I can eat anything and everything I want without any kind of physiological reaction whatsoever, with the exception of liquid milk, which isn't really milk anymore. It's pasteurized emotion. I don't even think it's food. Right. I can do chocolate. Right. I can do ice cream. I can do all of the stuff, everything, pizza, gluten, histamine, FODMAPs, everything, no problem. Mm -hmm. So I've got this idea in my, in my head of what's healthy, right? You've got like the paleo low carb, you've got gaps, you've got all of these promoted health diets. And then I've got what my body is hungry for now that it's able to communicate with me effectively. And it wants, it wants carbs. It wants rice. It wants orange juice. It wants the really high calorie, high nutrient dense foods. It's just asking for them in an almost insurmountable quantities. The first three or four weeks after this breakthrough, I was eating six to 7,000 calories every single day. It was like oh gosh. remarkable. And I've managed to gain about 22 kilos in two months. So it's massive. Wow. So I'm doing, I'm doing great. I'm doing fantastic, but I've reached this point where, and I think for anybody that achieved this kind of breakthrough, they would hit this point where I understand, I probably have a set point weight where my appetite will begin to adjust once I've received all of the nutrients that I need. But I'm at the point now where there is a level of fear that I am getting overweight, but my appetite is still very high. And I feel good when I eat these foods, but there's a part of me that's like, I feel like almost dirty. I feel lazy. I feel like I have no discipline. How do you, how would you go about this transition, this, this part in, in, in this experience? One of the things that we do in burnout recovery is we don't demonize people's coping mechanisms, regardless of how unhealthy they are, because mm -hmm. at some point in time that helped you Yes, probably when you yeah. were much younger. But I think the thing that we forget about coping mechanisms and addictions is they are rooted in safety mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So when you start thinking about it like that, and you kind of take the shame away from mm -hmm what we typically associate with like eating or drinking or drugs or things like that. Mm -hmm. And you start to understand this is something that started in order to protect me. Mm -hmm. Then we look at why do I need it? Why do I need the protection? Okay. What is in there? What have mm -hmm. I been dealing with? Once we start to deal with that, it's a little easier to, work around the coping mechanism to mm -hmm. adjust it to a point mm -hmm. of moderation or to find something that works better mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. quote unquote healthier for the individual, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. And we can sometimes do that with coaching. A lot of times what I'll recommend for people is that they work with a somatic therapist. Oh, I because, love somatic therapy. Mm, somatic therapy is, it. yeah, that's my new jam. I absolutely yeah. love it because we, particularly in Westernized cultures, are heavily divorced from the feelings in mm -hmm. our bodies. And so the fact that you are paying attention to not just how you feel physically, but how you feel mentally, how you feel emotionally, like that whole package of what's wrapped up in that is really important. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we do end up working with either some kind of underlying coping mechanisms, mm -hmm. patterns from childhood, trauma, something like that. And I find somatic therapy to be a mm -hmm. really, really nice adjunct. It's not something that I do personally, mm -hmm. um, but that's part of the other thing when it comes to this recovery process is if anybody is selling you the idea that they are the one size fits all panacea to your issues, 
take a beat and consider mm-hmm. what they're saying, because I don't think one person has all the answers. I agree. So, you know, in the process of my own recovery, I worked with a functional medicine colleague because I tend to not do my own work. I can run my own labs, but I'll let someone else interpret them because it's mm-hmm. just too heady. Mm-hmm. And I like being taken care of. <laughs> yeah. Um, of but I worked with a coach. I work with a somatic therapist. I worked with a functional medicine colleague. I went back to getting acupuncture myself. So those are all things that I did from four different people. So I, as a burnout recovery coach may help you identify some of these things, but if they're a little more deeply rooted than what I'm capable of dealing with, I'm going to send you to a somatic therapist, get you back in touch Mm -hmm. with your body, figure out how to really address some of that trauma. And you may find that you don't need the coping mechanism the same way, or that Mm -hmm. it's not a coping mechanism Mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. That's so cool. That's you've actually sort of tapped my slightly subtly selfish reason for hosting this podcast is I realized I need people that I can send people to because I don't have all of the answers. So Mm -hmm. this platform is is exactly as you described. It's designed to help people find the next person that they want to work with because you're not going to find everything in one person. And I'm sure you, you know this as well. As you go through the healing journey, you need different support. So you might start with somatic therapy because I feel this this is really, I call it like a bottoms up approach, you know, because instead of top down mm-hmm. conventional, like in the brain and then you've psychotherapy got, and, yeah, and then yeah. a little bit deeper, you've got like the subconscious, you've got hypnotherapy, but deeper than that, you've got somatic therapy. So it's like you're going from the bottom up and it's really hard to solve these deep problems from the top because they're suppressed. You can't access them. So sometimes you might need to start with somatic therapy and then you you become aware you're like oh i have all these self-limiting beliefs and you're you're able to experience them and become consciously aware of them because it's no longer a threat to your survival because you're physically more in tune with what's happening in your body so you become aware and you're like now i need hypnotherapy now i need cognitive behavioral therapy so it's like there's always this kind of progression as as things go on yeah so, absolutely and and that starting point is different for everybody exactly. i started with cognitive behavioral therapy when i was 19 years old because that's what was available to me mm-hmm. somatic therapy wasn't really a thing at that time and hypnosis was still kind of you know a little a little more yeah. in the woo yeah. <laughs> kind of category and like yeah. you know you think stage hypnosis and stuff like that which yeah, is, is awesome like and it's really fun and things like that right exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is not not what we do in, in hypnotherapy not because good. i do hypnotherapy but you know i worked with an amazing therapist Um, from 19 until I was about 32, I would just kind of check in with her when I needed. Mm -hmm. And when I moved to Rhode Island, I really wanted to see somebody in person. And I ended up seeing somebody who did internal family systems. And we do kind of an adjunct of that in hypnotherapy, which Mm -hmm. is ego state therapy. And that was incredibly useful to me and has maintained um, a, a high level of usefulness and utility in my life. Because Again, when it comes to things like coping mechanisms um, or, you know, these these bits of us who are just like, oh, I'm, a, I'm a little worried I'm going here. Mm-hmm. You can identify that as a part. Mm-hmm. That is yes. not all of you. That is a part of yes. you. So let's talk to that part. You know, some of the stuff that's going on in the somatic realm, mm-hmm. those are exiled parts. Those yes. are parts that are probably really young or they're hiding or they're scared. So being able to approach it from that way and say, you're not a bad person. You just have some parts that are really hurt and sad and grieving is massive for people because they're just like, oh mm-hmm. my God, this is, just, this is a sliver of who I am in my entirety. Uh, wh- exactly what you just described is exactly how I facilitated that, that healing breakthrough. There was a part of me that, So this is the part that most people are identified with that have these food sensitivities. They're like, I want to eat this food. I want pizza. I want ice cream. I like it. But the body somatically says like, this is not safe food. This is not good food for me. This is not safe. And for me, that was it. It connected um, a a lack of safety to all of these foods. So I experienced them. My body's like, oh God, we're dying. So it's massive reactions. Those foods aren't Mm -hmm. safe. So for me, it was getting the, I find that when you're doing this work and you look at things as parts, you've always got this tug where one's pulling one way and one's pulling the other. And if you can get them to talk to each other and then find a direction that they both want to go, that's where healing is because now you're not ripping yourself apart internally. You're cohesively like in the flow. You're, you're in alignment. That's exactly what alignment is, right? It's all your energy going the same direction. They literally call that integration in part. Integration. Yes. Yes. So like when you get them to talk to each other and like maybe one is doing something and there's another part who's just like, Hey, I'd be really good at that. I'm happy to take that job. 
so that the part that was initially causing the problem is just like, cool, here you go. Mm -hmm. And then everybody can play a little more nicely. They literally call that integration. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to experience firsthand or with, if you see someone else experience becoming integrated, it's like, you, it, you honestly can't explain it in words. It's like, you yeah. have to experience it to really know what that's like. It's, it just, it just changes you or the person in a, in a fundamental way, they're, they're a different person. They're, they're, whole, they're more whole. They're, they're more whole. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not against, fighting against each other, against themselves so much. Yeah, totally. So someone identifies with, with burnout. They say, with what you've said, I think I have burnout. Well, now what do I do? And obviously there's some variance. It's a very individualized thing, but is that, that there's usually some rough template or way that you can, way, way that you can look at this kind of thing. Yeah. So usually what I'll do, depending on, again, how the person presents, if they have some kind of like physical symptoms like fatigue or brain fog or, you know, depression, apathy, something like that. My first recommendation is if you have the means, see a functional medicine practitioner or a naturopath. If you don't see your primary care physician and just get a full blood mm -hmm. panel to the best of your ability of whatever's available to you, because things like vitamin and mineral deficiencies can have huge impacts on our mental health and our mental state. So when I first um, started my burnout recovery, I had gotten my blood work done and I live in the Northeast. And for your listeners who can't see me, I'm incredibly pale, borderline translucent. And so <laughs> I don't spend a ton of time in the sun and it's a very cloudy area. So my vitamin D was incredibly low. The lowest that it should be from a functional medicine perspective is 35, which is still not as much as you need mm -hmm. to be functional, but that's sort of the bottom cutoff. Mine was 14. Oh my so gosh. It wow. was more than 20 points lower. It was like, yeah, that's about as low as it can get without just starting yeah. to break down. Um, and I was. And so a couple of weeks on vitamin D and I actually had just enough energy to like get up and make dinner for myself again so that I wasn't eating takeout every night and I wasn't as depressed. And so that was a really good place for me to start to be like, okay, now I have a little more of that mental energy to be able to tackle some of the things that I need to do. So anytime you can rule out something like a vitamin or mineral deficiency, anemia, you know, gut issues, if you have the ability to rule that out, try and approach the physical first, just because addressing some of that may give you the wherewithal to dig a little deeper mm -hmm. into the, the kind of mental stuff that you have to do in order to do that. It's, it's a very good um, foundation, doesn't it? It really does. Yeah. And um, it can kind of uncover some other things that, you know, maybe if they're a little more chronic, you can address those once you feel like you have the capacity mm -hmm. to, which isn't necessarily the first thing that you're going to do. Um, beyond that, in terms of just wanting to find a way to start healing from burnout with like something that you can do yourself. Um, my coach does a values exercise and values exercises are actually very common in coaching, but she designed one specifically that I really like. So by identifying what is important to you, not society, not your family, mm. not your partner, nothing, sit down. It's a list of like 80 to hundred words and just circle what kind of lights you up, what's important to you, you know, joy, creativity, financial stability, curiosity, you know, integrity, whatever the case may be, circle a bunch of words. And I can actually send you a link to this if you want, if be your great. Listeners yeah. want it, because that, that would be awesome resource. because then they can yeah. just download it and do it. Yeah. But, um, you essentially, the short version is you figure out three to five values that are important to you. And then the thing that I like about Kate's tool is that you put action statements with it. So if, like curiosity was one of uh, my values, which surprised me um, because mm. when I when I thought about it after I identified it, I was like, oh, that makes so much sense based on how I live my life, but I never thought about it that mm. way. And the action statement that went along with that for me was embrace curiosity. Okay. So like, how do I want that value to show up in my life? It's not just, you know, okay, curiosity is important. What does that look like? How do I put that into action? I want to embrace curiosity. So curiosity, so, I imagine, has a lot of, it's, it, there's a lot of novelty to do with that. It's new things, right? It's because you're not curious about things you already understand or things you're familiar with. It's funny, you would think that, but it showed up for me in very interesting ways. 
Okay. So like, I'm, I'm one of those people who, you know, I've kind of got like a type A sort of nervous mentality. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of anxiety, I have a ton of social anxiety. And so, oh God, where, where's a good example where it showed up? I can't, I had one specifically in any case, we'll, I'll just use this because it, it would work just as well. If I text somebody and like, I don't expect people to get back to me right away, mm-hmm. but I might be worried that they're upset with me if I mm-hmm. don't hear from them or yeah. some, did I say something wrong the last time that we hung out? Ugh, you know, it, it kind of gets me in my head mm-hmm. and that gets my cortisol going and it makes me really anxious. And I remember embrace curiosity. Okay. Well, what, what could be all of the reasons for why they didn't text me back? Maybe oh. it didn't go through. Maybe, oh. uh, maybe they're busy. Maybe their phone was dead. Um, Maybe they did what I do all the time, which was they typed the answer and they didn't hit send. And so being curious about that situation, as opposed to trying to jump to the conclusion or figure it out and get inside Mm. somebody else's head, totally takes the stress off of that for me. And it gives me an opportunity to be like, there are way more options here. And I don't need to let my anxious brain go to where it always goes because my value is curiosity. So does it show up in my life in other ways? Yes. I, when I travel... I largely don't make plans. I'll book one, you know, I'll get tickets to like one concert or a rave or something like that. And then I will fly to wherever I'm going and just let the wind take me. Mm -hmm. I'm very curious when I travel. And that's something where it shows up naturally. Where it doesn't show up naturally is places like, you know, not hearing back from a friend Mm -hmm. when you text them. That's Mm -hmm. where like the anxiety ramps up. And that's where that value becomes incredibly useful to me in order to just function in my day to day life. Mm -hmm. And it, it looks like it doesn't just provide you with, a coping strategy it first of all it dilutes the focus so instead of you thinking about like what does this mean about me you've actually you're more interested in what's happening on the other side of the equation that's also going to help to facilitate connection and understanding compassion and empathy so it's mm-hmm. like it's such it's so fascinating the way that you describe that you that you use that trait in such mm-hmm. a, an interesting way it's like first so the whole thing works basically just around you being able to become aware of a trait that you that you identify with but you weren't identified with it so first of all it was about awareness becoming aware of what's important to you and then this is like a new tool in your toolbox so instead of walking around and trying to like hammer everything because that's all you've got you've now Mm -hmm. got a screwdriver or a spanner you've got other tools to apply in different situations that help you manage regulate your emotions solve problems in different ways it's that's such a, a very interestingly like in my mind i can see this unfathomably complex pathway of different solutions that come out of having a new tool like that it's almost infinitely applicable it's yeah absolutely absolutely. that's that's incredible and we recommend often that patients go through or clients go through their values exercise six months to a year because values change you change change values change so so curiosity is still a core value of mine but it's not something that i need to be reminded of that I know that I've had that for about, you know, a year, year and a half, that's pretty well integrated into mm-hmm. how I live my life. So when I redid my values exercise, um, one of them was, I can't remember exactly the action statement around it, um, but it was like, I, I will, you know, first and foremost, put my health beyond anything else. But in my mind, that is mental, physical, and spiritual health. And those three, three things, every once in a while, something else is going to need to take priority. So a few months ago, I came home after one of my longer days of work and I was really tired and I knew I had energy to clean out my refrigerator or make dinner. I couldn't do both. And the trash was coming the next day. So I needed to get everything into my rubbish bins. And I was like, I I cannot make dinner right now. Like I do not have the emotional wherewithal to do both of these things. So I sat down for a second. I took a deep breath and I said, what is more important to me in this moment, my physical health or my mental health? And with zero hesitation, wow. the answer was my mental health. So I ordered a gluten-free pizza from Domino's. I made the best choice that I could for my physical health because I do have a gluten sensitivity, but I ordered a gluten-free pizza. And while they were making the pizza, I cleaned out my fridge and I had dinner, the best dinner that I had available, knowing that I would go back to my primarily paleo. I'm not super strict about it, um, but that's what feels good to me to eat. So I'll go back to my primarily paleo thing tomorrow, 
but tonight my mental health is what's the most important to me. And one pizza is not going to unwind my physical health. So understanding that that value is there and being able to just sit down, take a breath and ask that question and not, can I curse on here? Is that okay? Yeah. I, not shit on myself yeah. for making the choice <laughs> made, you know, um, that was, that was really critical to me being able to just have a very smooth night. The rest of the night, I was completely unstressed because I made choices based on my value system that work for me. That is a wonderful story. That is such a powerful anecdote to, to have. I'm sure, sh- I'm sure you've used that before because the power behind that is, is incredible. You can, you can, I can see how so many people struggle because we all have needs, right? And we don't all have an, always have enough time to fulfill them all to the level that we would like to. So sometimes- It's unrealistic. It's completely sometimes, unrealistic. Yeah. Sometimes life is just like, bad stuff happens. It's like, let's manage it. Let's do the best you can. It's easy to have this, as you said, perfect paleo, like, oh, I'm Zen and I meditate every single day. It's like, sometimes you're in the trenches. Like sometimes you're at war. You have to- get things done and you have to try and figure out how to do the best you can with what you've got. And I think what you've described is having this awareness around it's, it, awareness is the key here because without awareness, you'd just be stuck in this d- despair spiral, probably not do either. You'd have a dirty fridge and you'd have no dinner and you just go to bed hungry and distressed. So it's hundred like, percent, which I did. I used to do that yeah. because I didn't have the framework in play and I would be so overwhelmed by what choice do I have to make? That's a beautiful thing about the values exercise is that it takes those choices almost off the table. It's not mm-hmm. that you don't have the freedom to make them, but the stress around making mm-hmm. them is significantly reduced mm-hmm. because knowing your values makes it for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I find that anxiety more often than not, isn't, isn't the the choice that you make it's trying to make the decision it's like if you can pick one and go one way you can go with it anxiety is gone it's like you've made a decision you're going it's making the decision that can be really difficult so if you have there's this a, awareness you can do it yeah there's a great uh there's a great book that i love it's probably about 10 years old now it's called the geography of bliss it's by a guy named eric great Meyer. Name. I think. Yeah. He's a really fascinating guy. He's a journalist and he decided to take a journalistic approach to finding the happiest and saddest places in the world. So he went to the Netherlands and Switzerland and um, Bhutan and Moldova. And um, when he was in Switzerland, they were talking about choice and how too many choices actually causes stress. And they've Mm. done studies on this. And one of the, the studies that they did was they asked people of different nationalities, if you have the opportunity to go to an ice cream shop that has 50 flavors or 10 flavors, which would you choose? And like Americans, obviously like all we chose like 50 flavors because we want all the things. Um, but many people in Switzerland were like, 10 is enough. 50 is too much. That's mm-hmm. anxiety producing. Yeah. Like you don't, you don't need it. I saw something similar, took it a step further where they had, it was like, they could choose between 10. They, they rated how much they enjoyed the ice cream that they chose. And then they had the choice of three. It was vanilla, strawberry, or chocolate. And the people that had less choice got more satisfaction out of the one that they actually had because it wasn't such an overwhelming experience. So, And you're not thinking about like, oh, I'm having this and I'm enjoying mm-hmm. it, but should I have gotten the mint chocolate yeah. chip? Because I like that and I always get There's that. that one something the different. fear of it's just missing the... out. Yeah. 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 Wow. Fantastic. So more is not always better. And that's very much highlighted there. Sometimes the simplicity is really what you want to be going for. Yeah, so, absolutely. So I I like to ask everybody that comes on here a couple of questions just before we wrap up. So what is something that would be almost universally applicable to anybody that could be watching this right now that they can do that's very cost-effective or free to improve the quality of their life, their healing right now? Breathe. Breathe. Is that- It sounds so underrated and it sounds so dumb and it sounds so zen like and i'm not <laughs> like i'm not i'm the least zen person sometimes i get really excited about stuff passionate it is it is something that you can do passively and it is something you can do actively and so much of the time we passively breathe we don't embody the action of breathing So when I say breathe, I don't mean go sit on a yoga cushion and do the hands and be there for an hour. I'm saying put both of your feet on the ground, sit in a chair that supports your back, close your eyes and breathe for one minute. 
seven count in, seven count out, that type of a thing. Really feel the breath going in. Feel how cold it is when you inhale. Feel how warm it is comparatively when you exhale. If you can, I actually did a one minute meditation. You can relax different parts of your body with each breath. So on the first mm. inhale and exhale, I have people relax their eyes on the second. I have them relax their jaw. These are places that we carry tension that we don't always think about. So breathing is you're doing it anyway. So you may as well make it <laughs> you know, effective. And it's something that you can do for such a short period of time. Like one minute will help reset your nervous system. It really does. Doesn't it? it, it it's unbelievable. Whenever you're altering the duration of the exhale whenever you extend it even slightly it's like parasympathetic activation every time so every time you mm -hmm. breathe out every single breath you are moving yourself closer towards parasympathetic activation so that's exactly that's the rest and digest nervous system mm -hmm. so breathe that was that that's a, that's a common one actually because well it's really free isn't it you can do it wherever you want you can do it anywhere everyone yeah, can do it yeah Absolutely. And if you want to take something like that a step further, but particularly for people who deal with stress or anxiety, um, there's something called the emotional freedom technique. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with it? Yes. It's the, okay. the tapping. The tapping. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, I can also send you a PDF. I have a PDF tutorial for people. That'd be great. Um, that is amazing for reducing stress. And again, also bringing the parasympathetic nervous system mm -hmm. online. So the, the short kind of version of that is you're actually tapping on acupuncture points. Mm -hmm. And while you're doing that, you're saying something like, let it go. Or for me, sometimes when I'm feeling particularly anxious, I will say, I, I am safe. It's just kind of like a reminder, mm -hmm. like I am safe right now. I'm safe. Mm -hmm. And I'll go through that a couple of times and kind of just get my parasympathetic nervous system online. So if you want right. something that's a little more action oriented than just breathing, because everybody does say that. And it's like, after a while, it's just like, oh God, again, breathing. Mm -hmm. um, you can do that as well. So I'll get cool. you that PDF too. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll leave that PDF in the Facebook support group. There's a Perfect. section at the top. People can just go there. They can download it. It's very, very easy. So we'll leave that in there. Great. So final question. If you were to enter an elevator, you've got 30 seconds to talk to an influential member of the government, medical, presidential mm. sort of level. They're receptive to anything you have to say. So you can tell them whatever you want and you want to have the biggest positive influence on the direction of health and healing in your country, in the world. What would you tell them? You have 30 seconds. Oh man, that's a good question. <laughs> that's, that's putting me on the spot. Yeah. Cause there's so much, right. isn't there? <laughs> yeah, there is. I would probably ask them what kind of legacy they want to leave in terms of health and wellness for people. You know, I'm, I'm coming from the perspective of the United States where we have one of the worst healthcare systems. We have some of the highest mortality rates for, you know, pregnant women and things like that. This is not the legacy of a powerful, strong, or meaningful country. Like, how do you want to bring meaning into the world? How do you want to support people? You can support people by giving them resources. You can support people by giving them education and capacity and agency. I think that's something that we lack so much is agency over our, our own bodies and our own health and our own, you know, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, financial wealth and capacity. So much suffering comes from the fact that people's basic resources are not being met. And if you have someone who is fed, who is sheltered, who is clothed, who, and who is heard and accepted for who they are, People like that do not have addictive behaviors. Mm -hmm. They are able to heal those. They are able to deal with them. They are in an environment that supports them. So what kind of environment can we create that fully supports people to be 100% themselves? Okay, wow. So that's a powerful shift from the current paradigm of sick care to creating and cultivating an environment of almost effortlessly natural wellness. Absolutely. That, wow. that would be okay. my goal. That that's what I would want. <laughs> so that's, that's a deep one, isn't it? Cause you've got to go into some deep places to, to get that going, but that is that uh, I love that. That's a great message. Thank well, you. It's been lovely having you. Um, this has been absolutely fantastic. I've been animated. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I can't wait to have you on again. I'm sure we can talk for 
many hours about several different subjects. So I'm sure we will have you on again sometime soon. I really appreciate what, what it is that you do coming on, sharing your information and all of the people that you work with and the, the positive ripple that you're spreading out into the, oh, into the planet. So I really appreciate it. Thank you everything. so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for hosting such an amazing platform and for the work that you do and getting this kind of information out and getting these resources to people because it's really, really meaningful. Thank you. Yeah. I think when you, when you've come from a place where you've suffered as much as I have, you really, there is that strong motivation to make sure that other people don't have to go through what you did very much the same way that you just described. If people have their basic needs met, strong family structures, good nutrition, they get all their basic needs met. You don't have to go down that hole. So yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, thank that's you. everything for today. Um, thank you for watching and we'll see you soon. See you soon, Elizabeth. You've been listening to the Holistic Healing Collective with William Dickinson. Our passion is to heal with energy, holistic, and plant medicine using a science-based blend of mind, body, and spirit. We hope you've enjoyed the show, and we hope you've gotten some useful and practical information. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and tell a friend or two. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, find us on Facebook at the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast and Support Group. We'd love to see you. Take care, be well, and see you next time on the Holistic Healing Collective.